je m'appelle Substack dans l'internet. Et, and I'm going to talk about immutable offline web apps and what kinds of things we might be doing in the future and such. So I think convention-driven tools and convention-driven approaches are really good for conventional problems, but the problem is we have so many different new, crazy, wacky libraries coming out and all these ridiculous, very, very important, useful new browser APIs um, that maybe we need to rethink a lot of those. So you can, you can, you know, build web apps for banks and insurance companies, that kind of thing. It, it pays well, but there's also this wonderful land of new interesting problems that I think is, is really worth considering. So one thing that we can maybe rethink our conventions about is how the web works. So you go to a server in a web browser, you get what the server sent you, right? That's, that's the simple model. So uh, on every request, every browser is requesting a new document from the server, but um, the one problem with this is that even if we're using stuff like WebRTC, the server still gets to decide what JavaScript it wants to send us, and it turns out um, there are some problems with this. So if you have flaky internet, it's not going to work very well. Um, these things are kind of built around the idea that you'll have a pretty good, pretty low latency network, which is very rarely the case outside of Mountain View. And um, also the server can just kind of change how it works at any time. And usually they update the front end at the same time, which can be a big problem with some of the new things coming out in browsers like uh, the crypto API. So browsers right now, if you have a recent build of Firefox, Chrome, or IE 11, have this thing called uh, window.crypto.subtle, and I'll get to that a bit more in a bit, but to summarize, it's a very bad idea to let this server send you arbitrary payloads whenever it feels like it, because if you're storing your local keys in the browser, you want to keep them in the browser. You don't want potential server-side code to just do whatever it wants with that information. Also, when you have this kind of architecture, fundamentally, uh, users are sort of beholden to what service providers think, uh, think should be the case. So, Here's a proposal for how we can make services uh, work much, much better offline and gracefully upgrade when the network is available, and also at the same time give users a lot more control over the application delivery. So, um, so this is the cache manifesto. This is, this is a browser API that we now have, um, the cache manifest, and it's really useful and we can use it for this really cool little trick. So here, you can read that. I've got a little bit of uh, code, so I'll just whip up a server really fast, and I can show you how servers work. So um, servers work with cache manifest. So if we create a server with HTTP.create server, blah, 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 rec res, whatever. This is just a standard Node.js Node web server, right? And then we'll listen on port 5060. OK, so if we just print out the rec.method and rec.url, we can see what the browser is actually going to send us. So if I just make this a static web server really fast, um, so I'll require a module for that, as you do, and just host up the current directory, I think. Um, yes. So now we can just pass that along to ecstatic and run our server, like so. So this will run on 5060. So if I go to that location, we have some text. Great. Um, so this is what the server did. So it got our, our, it requested our server, it loaded this app cache file. Um, it actually loaded it twice for a silly reason, but the cool thing is because I've set up this app cache file, if I refresh it, uh, the only thing that the browser actually requests again is the app cache file. So I can kill the server and the page still works. I can, in fact, close that tab altogether, open it again. It's still there, which is really cool. Um, but there's, there's a little bit of a problem, right? If we spin up the server again, it's still requesting that app cache file again. So if we change the app cache, the server could potentially serve whatever code that it wants. So to fully brick a server, you can do this other little trick. Uh, because we've already sent some headers, we'll have to change the port. But now we can run a different little trick here. So we'll set the max age in the response to be 100 years in the future. By then, we'll finally let the server uh, send us a file. So if we do hyperboot.appcache, uh, which I believe is the file name, um, then we'll fs create read stream. Let's do this really quick. So 
it's uh, hyperboot.app cache um, dot pipe res, and we've set the header correctly, so there we go. Else, do that. So now, we'll still print out every message, but hopefully, now, if we go to the new service, the first time, we still get all of those requests, but now, I refreshed it, it still works offline, but now the server isn't sending any data. It's not sending any more requests. We've broken the website, and I maintain this is a good thing, because, because now we can actually start to give the, the browser much more control and the user much more control over how they use web apps. So that's the basic trick for how this stuff works. Um, so there's some other really cool properties about these kinds of peer-to-peer -peer, uh, distributed systems. Um, like BitTorrent, for example, is, is a very, has a very neat dynamic about scaling. Unlike most other web services that are centralized, the more people use BitTorrent, the better it works for everyone, which I think is a really cool property. But if you make your applications work offline, you have infinite scaling, right? The first time somebody gets a web page, they can just use it as much as they want forever. It doesn't matter that, that if like two people are using a web app that's cached locally, or a billion people are, the server load is the same, like past the initial payload, right? So you, and you could send these things around on like floppy disks or whatever you like. Um, I think it's a really cool property. So for, my for the next thing, um, you can actually do a lot of the same kinds of real-time stuff that we might do just in a, in a server-based app offline. So I wrote this module uh, a week ago, I think, called PageBus that does exactly this. So, how does PageBus work? So, I'll show you. Um, so, PageBus basically just uses the uh, iframe API. Hang on. So here, I've loaded this application. Um, it's printed a message. I can say, wow, it's like a real-time app, right? Um, the thing is, I can load another tab, paste it in, and hey, we're chatting. I don't know how well you can see that. There we go. So we're chatting. That's cool. Uh, but there's a server, right? So surely the server must be relaying those messages. But here, I will kill the server. But somehow, we're still talking. That's because I'm, I'm on the same host, right? This is the same browser. So of course that should work. It's using a shared worker to implement this little trick. and. Uh, it can do something really nifty. If you, if you start organizing your app this way, not only are you minimizing a huge latency penalty when you go to the server to do something that, like, we'll just update, we'll just update another tab or an iframe or, or whatever, you can actually implement um, some other really ridiculously neat stuff. So Hyperboot is a, it's this system for bricking your own website, but you allow users to upgrade. So here I've got the demo app. You can click it. It does some lightning, but there's a little gear in the corner. And this gear is all of the versions that are available. And so I can upgrade or decide to switch to whatever version I like of a web app. And the next time that I refresh, I get the last version that was sent. So I'm not actually online right now. I've loaded this page previously, and it's cached forever. Um, this is the cool thing about uh, both content addressable storage that I'm using and, and um, and these offline tricks is that you can actually build really functional, seemingly like ordinary web pages that are actually totally offline, or at least they can upgrade to a network when it's available. So there's this other thing that we can maybe take a look at, uh, authentication. So doing authentication without servers with like immutable pages, how would you even do that? Like, what if we can make app authentication work offline? And what if we put users in control of their own pass usernames and passwords and all that kind of garbage. So how do we do that? Well, we already have the answer, asymmetric crypto. Every web developer here knows how this is done, right? You, you set up some SSH keys, and you throw your public key on the servers you want to connect to, and then you can just connect to them. The server doesn't have to store your passphrases. Those are like your own private thing. So why can't we have this for the web? Well, now we can because of that window.crypto.subtle, all of this new stuff landing in browsers. We can sign, we can encrypt, we can do digests, we can even wrap keys with uh, 
symmetric ciphers so that later we can export them and save them securely to web servers when we choose to. So this is a project called Keyboot. So Keyboot kind of blends the hyperboot approach of using the, cat, the app cache to store everything permanently because the server shouldn't be ever allowed to push whatever code it likes to users because that could potentially compromise their security, especially if there are big three-letter agencies involved and subpoenas and secret court orders and that sort of stuff. So, so what might Keyboot look like? So here is the main page. Um, when you first land on the page, it looks like this. So it asks you to generate a key pair. So here we'll generate a 4,096-bit key pair, which does take a little bit. But once we've done that, there we go. Key pair generated. Click Continue. So now we've got this nice little interface for dealing with uh, asymmetric keys. So here I have a public key, and it's stored completely in the browser in, in local storage in IndexedDB. And now um, we can just supply the URL to our Keyboot server, which has been cached forever, so this will work offline. And we can sign in. So here, a request has been sent. And if I move, move it over to two tabs, we can either reject or approve an application. And when we can approve an application, we can start just signing messages. So here, I'll type some text. I'll sign the message. And that is this, the Base64 blob that proves that I wrote that message. And the server that we signed into doesn't have to know anything special to make that work. It doesn't have to ever know our keys, and neither does the server. Only we know our keys in our own browser, or if we choose, we can encrypt that key pair and send it to a server that we trust reasonably well. So these are the kinds of things now that you can do with all of this wacky technology. So I have a little bit of time left, and I'll, I'll kind of go into another project I've been working on lately called uh, ForkDB. So this lets you... Uh, do replication in such a way that it works really, really well offline with this kind of model. So um, right now, unfortunately, I only have the server version working, but I can show you that at least. So let's make sure I don't have those databases around. OK, great. So with ForkDB, the basic idea is that you just can treat it a little bit like a key value store. So here we'll specify a value and pipe that into ForkDB create. We'll give it a key name, which is like keyzo. And uh, that's all you need to do. So it'll crank a bit. It gives us a hash. The hash is actually the hash of the document itself plus the metadata. So this way, we can just like Git establish this really robust chain of trust that's inherently secure. So if we want to make an update to, that, to, this, to this database, what we can do is insert a new document that just points back at our existing document. So if we want to make a new value, we can just point at the previous document like this. So now we've got two documents in our database, and we can actually query what like, the latest version of our, of our key is called keyzo with a heads command. So if we do heads, we get the single hash. But what if you want to make uh, two versions? Like what if somebody makes a version offline, right? So this would kind of, in most databases, be considered a conflict. But if we take this different approach, that there is no canonical source of truth, then we can actually do something very, very neat. So now, instead of that being a conflicted state, we just have two heads instead of one. And to merge our content back again, we can just create a new document that's like all better, and we can just point back at both of the previous hashes. So if we point back at both of the heads, then we'll just be left with one head again. We query the heads. There we go. So what's cool? is that if you have a browser implementation of this kind of stuff, not only can you sync with a server, but you can actually sync with other clients. And you can sync with other applications that are maybe even not online at all. Um, you're really free to sort of choose the way that your data flows together. So uh, for a really simple example of how syncing works, you can just run the sync command um, given one of the databases. So here uh, we run sync with two of them, hang on. So if we make, if we make another database, um, create some data, Kizo, create some new data. So now we'll sync these two databases by just 
uh, piping the standard in and standard out together. So if we sync them, and we sync our, for, our first one. So now, in the second database, we have all of the hashes from the first one. Great. So the nice thing is, this model lets you employ a fire and forget model for replication. So replication will always succeed because every hash just points somewhere. And links can be resolved asynchronously. They can be resolved lazily. You can have dangling references. It's fine. Um, because the data structure is fundamentally just this log that depends, and you can sync very trivially from that. So this is just one of the wacky ideas that I'm planning on building for this offline authentication system. So you'll be able to build something like an offline wiki that can sync with other wikis over WebRTC or sync with the server very trivially without actually doing storing any user information on any server, unless the user decides that that's what they want. So thanks. <laughs>